So let's get going. Um, Article 430 is the main reference source for motors, motor circuits, and controls. Um, the reason that I have this is there are a number of slides that have to do with the National Electrical Code. Most of our presentations, they're for engineers and for electricians. For the engineers, we just send you a certificate, but for the, engine, for the electricians, we actually have to have your license number so we can log in and give you credit. And for this course, for the electricians only, you will get two hours of credit that are general industry credit, and then you will get two hours of credit that are NEC credits. So for electricians, those are generally the harder ones as they have to have specific credits for the National Electrical Code. And so half the credits for this class will be National Electrical Code, and that's why you'll see some of these slides. Um, I'm going to uh, start the little question. I think we did this in our arc flash. How much current is in the average lightning bolt? And the answer is 30,000 amps. This is kind of our safety share. So anytime you're working on a variable frequency drive, remember that the potential explosion that could occur from a short circuit is approximately the same current as in a lightning bolt and that these things can be very dangerous. So please be very careful and wear your PPE when operating on a VFD while energized. Um, what was the greatest invention in history? I won't comment on this. The fact is that uh, there is no universal uh, agreement on what the greatest invention in history, but hopefully you may see some of your uh, favorites there. Um, these are just a few inventions that uh, I put down that I think are interesting. The boomerang, which is pretty fascinating, is more than 15,000 years old. Um, chocolate, between the 3rd and 10th century. Beer, before 6,000 BC. Why am I talking about this? Because I am going to tell you what I think the greatest invention in history is, and that is coming up shortly. So let's get into motor theory. This is a simple motor that I invented in my head. Um, we have a magnet, which has got a south and north pole on the outside. We've got a cardboard tube, and we've got a magnet on the inside with a pin that allows that magnet to spin. Now what is going to happen here? The north pole is next to the north pole. We'll call the outside the stator and the inside the rotor, and because light charges repel, that inside magnet is going to tend to spin on the pin there that you see in the middle. Now, which way is it going to spin? The answer is, we don't really know. Um, it will probably spin the way you push it. If you push that a little bit to one side or the other, it'll spin that way, and it will come to rest in a position like this, where it's rotated 180 degrees, the North Pole is attracted to the South Pole. Now, let me grab the outside of that motor, or that uh, stator, the outside magnet, and slowly, pull it around the cardboard tube. As I do that, the inside rotor follows it, and voila, we have an electric motor. This is the way that all electric motors work. All electric motors work by one magnet following another magnet. Now in this case, you might say, well, that's a really stupid uh, invention because you've got to pull that magnet around on the outside by hand. You might as well just turn the shaft. Okay, I concur. So let's try to make it a little bit more automatic. In this case, I'm going to put iron. I've got iron on the top, iron on the bottom, on the stator, and that iron has copper wire around it, and I'm going to plug it into the wall. So when I plug it into the wall over here on the right, we have our sine wave coming out of the wall. And when the sine wave is positive, current is going to flow around this top way to create a north pole. That same current is wired the opposite on the bottom magnet, excuse me, and it's going to create a south pole. So now this magnet is going to rotate. Which direction? We don't know. Whichever direction you push it. But once it rotates, then this line side power is going to go from positive to negative. And when that happens, the current in the electromagnets reverse, and therefore this magnet changes from a north pole to a south pole. And the lower one goes from a south pole to a north pole. 
So it is going to rotate 180 degrees up here. It's going to rotate another 180 degrees here. Therefore, in one electrical cycle, it will rotate one rotation. So we'd have down here at the bottom one revolution per cycle. We have 60 cycles per second in the United States, and we have 60 seconds in a minute everywhere on Earth. And if you multiply that out, you find out that this motor will run 3,600 RPM. Now, what if we don't want to run 3,600 RPM? What if we want it to run slower? Well, one way to do that is to add more poles. So in this case, the theory is exactly the same, except that we have four poles on the rotor and four poles on the stator. And when we're in a positive state here on the AC sine wave, this will be north, this will be north, this will be south, this will be south, and so on. And it will only rotate 90 degrees. So it will rotate 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here, and 90 degrees here. Therefore, it will take two complete cycles for the motor to make one rotation. Therefore, we have one revolution per cycle, per two cycles, times 60 seconds, excuse me, 60 cycles in a second, 60 seconds in a minute. This motor rotates at 1800 RPM, and you will recognize that's pretty standard for a motor. This would be a four pole motor. How do we know that? One, two, three, four. There are four poles on the outside and four poles on the inside. Can we add more poles? The answer is yes. We can add six poles, we can add eight poles. You can add as many poles as you would like. And we won't go so far as to show those, but let's just show you the formula. Your RPM is 120 times the frequency divided by the number of poles. Now I'm going to go back one slide and I just want you to imagine that you're a marionette. You want this rotor to go around but as a marionette, you can't pull it around. You can only lift up and down. So as you lift up, you're creating a magnet that goes up. As you push down, you're creating a magnet that goes down. That's essentially where we are on a single phase motor. We can't have a magnet that goes around the motor. On a single phase motor, the magnet only goes up and down. And so you have several problems here. Number one, which way is it going to move? We don't know. On a single phase motor, you don't know which direction it's going to go. Secondly, it may not move at all because if it's right here perfectly positioned under that pole, that pole will be pushing it away. But if it's not pushing to the right or the left, it's not going to move. Finally, you'll notice that we have a lot of magnet when we have a strong voltage. When you're down here at zero voltage, we have no magnet. So on a uh, single phase motor, the magnet is pulsing. It's pulsing up and down, just like a marionette would pulling it up and down, but trying to get it to go around, and that creates a lot of vibration. In other words, and I'll try to keep it clean here, but single pole motors suck. Now, there are, oh, excuse me, let me tell you the solution to all of this. This was developed by a guy named Nikola Tesla. I wish I had more time to talk about Nikola Tesla, but a genius back in the 19th century who looked at all these problems and decided, how can I fix this? And he sat down, scratched out his idea in the sand, and it became the three-phase motor. Now, a three-phase motor has three phases. So, excuse me, here is A phase, here's B phase, and here is C phase. And the electric, electricity, the voltage, is 120 degrees displaced. So you still are just going up and down in A phase, up and down or almost back and forth now in B phase, and the same in C phase, but they're out of phase for, with one another. They're not going that in the, in the same uh, time. So when A phase is most positive, B and C phases are going to both be negative. So we sometimes look at magnetic action as uh, like rubber bands. And so if you think about a rubber band that connects this positive to A positive and this positive, let's say, to C and this positive to B, then by adjusting the tension on those rubber bands, you could actually get that to assume any different position. Now, 
notice that this is a two-pole motor. Why is it a two-pole? Because there are two poles in each phase. So a three-phase two-pole motor will uh, also run 3,600 RPM. Therefore, this will run 3,600 RPM again in America. And if that's hard to understand how this works, let's show you an animation. I love this animation. Now, we're only showing the positive part of A phase, the positive part of B phase, and the positive part of C phase. In a real motor, there, of course, would be the negative as well. And you'll notice that the A phase voltage is causing the, vol the uh, flux, the magnetic flux, to increase. Now, the magnetic flux is decreasing, and then the magnetic flux is going negative. All of that is coming from this A phase coil. Likewise, here's our C phase coil. You'll notice that the magnet is in phase with the C phase coil. And then we have the B phase coil. So we have three magnets. And when we add the magnets together, the total magnet will basically be uh, from the middle of the motor to the outside of this last arrow here, right? So from there to the outside of this last arrow. Now, what do you notice? You notice two things. Number one, the distance from the inside of the motor to the outside of the last arrow always stays the same. In other words, instead of the magnetic flux pulsing, it is always constant. That's brilliant. Second, what will you notice? The magnetic flux rotates around the motor. So at this point, I am really back to my invention. And the only difference between my invention and Nikola Tesla's is with me. I have to drag that thing around there by hand with Nikola Tesla, it's all automatic. This, in my opinion, is the greatest invention in the history of the world. Now, you can disagree with that. You could say it's law or it is uh, maybe the transistor, who knows. But this motor, essentially, this didn't start the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine did, but this electrified the world. How would you like to live without electricity? And Nik Nikola Tesla would order to do the work that used to have to be done manually by humans. And therefore, it revolutionized the world. It did the, work, or, or the uh, work for us. And it is, it, how, where can you find motors? Every place. This has made more money for more people than any other invention. And I think it's just absolutely brilliant. So I can't help talking a little bit about what an amazing invention the three-phase motor was. Um, now, Nikola Tesla, of course, was cheated out of the patent rights uh, by uh, Thomas Edison and ended up dying in poverty, while, uh, of course, uh, others went on to make fortunes off of motors. Now, if you don't have a three-phase motor and you have a single-phase motor, I told you all the problems with it. Single-phase motors don't actually work the way I described them because you never know when they're going to start and you never know which direction you're going to go. So I am not going to cover these next few slides in detail because we did cover them in our motor class, but you have to add what I call a Band-Aid. And the Band-Aid tries to get the motor to start and it gives you and it makes sure that the motor go, always goes in the correct direction. So single phase motors have, they have split phase motors in which you have two separate windings. One is your main winding and one is this auxiliary winding meant to make the motor go the right direction and to start. Here's a capacitor start. Here is a permanent capacitor. Here's a capacitor start and capacitor run. And finally, we have a shaded pole winding. Those are five different ways people have come up with to overcome the inherent problems in a single phase motor. The, the, uh, my advice, of course, is stay away from single phase motors, use three phase motors, they don't have any of these problems and don't need these band-aids. Of course, I recognize that we can't always do that in our homes, we don't have three phase, but you certainly want to use three phase wherever you can. Now, can you run a variable frequency drive on a single phase motor? The answer is yes but I don't really recommend it. You know that you can have a single phase power come into your VFD and the VFD will change that into three phase. So I highly recommend if you don't have three phase power, 
still use a three phase motor and then a VFD can change that from single phase into three phase. That's of course, if you wish to use a VFD on a motor. But I will say there are VFDs that run on single phase motors, but they require certain types of motors. You typically can't run a VFD on a motor with capacitors. Okay, generators. I will go through this quickly. A generator is a backwards motor. So instead of using electricity with power going into the motor and producing power going out of the motor, mechanical with torque and speed, we do it backwards. If you take a conductor here and you push it through a magnetic field, it would generate a voltage in that conductor. If you spin a conductor in a magnetic field, it will produce a sine wave because when it's right up here, it's moving in the flux, but not through the flux. And when it's moving in the flux in the same direction of the flux, you get no voltage. But as it moves through the flux, as in position three over here, then it will generate voltage. And as you can see, simply rotating that in a magnetic field will give you a sine wave. And that's how generators work. This is a real generator. This is the rotor and this is the stator. And so in this case, we have the rotor has a field on it and the stator is the armature. So we put DC current through the field that creates an electromagnet. Then this rotor spins and that magnet creates an output voltage on the stator. And in order to control the output voltage on the stator, we control the DC current into the rotor and that controls the magnetic flux in the rotor and that in turn will control the voltage on the stator. Here is a two-pole rotor. You can see that we have the two poles and then we have the magnet wire that is around those poles to create the electromagnet when we put DC current through it. And here we have a four-pole rotor. So in this case, your engine would have to be 3,600 RPM. In this case, the engine would be 1,800 RPM in order to generate a... Uh, 60 hertz signal. Now, this is another little uh, um, animation, and you can see we're only showing, again, the positive side of A phase and neglecting the, the negative side just for simplicity. And this is an induction motor. So with an induction motor, you have these uh, copper, or they could be aluminum bars that are just in a squirrel cage or a hamster cage type construction and we simply short them together on the end. So we short them on this end, and then we short them on the other end. And when we have a magnetic flux that goes around the outside of the motor, the stator, of course that magnetic flux is actually going through there, but uh, it will create currents just the way we showed you a few moments ago in the rotor bars. And as those currents go through, go in the rotor bars, they go, for instance, back on this rotor bar, around the end ring, back on this rotor bar on the opposite side, then around the end ring. And so we're creating a circular current in the rotor and that circular current in the rotor will create an electromagnet in the rotor and that rotor will then begin to follow the electromagnet on the outside. In this case, the rotor always has to slip a little bit and we call that because we engineers are brilliant, we call it slip. And so you will notice that all induction motors slip a little bit and instead of being 1800 RPM, they will be 1785 or 1770 or some amount. And so if you had a 1770 RPM motor, then that means at full load, that motor is going to slip by 30 RPM, 1800 at minus 1770. And the more, more uh, efficient your motor is, generally the lower that slip. That slip will be dependent on load and it will slip that much at full load. At no load, it will slip hardly at all, but it'll slip a little bit, maybe a couple of RPM. And as you load the motor, you can hear the sound change because that sound changes as you get increasing slip and the motor slows down. Here is an actual cutaway of a motor and you can see there's the end rings and here's the iron and you can't see the rotor bars because they're going through the middle of the iron. You must have copper or aluminum or some conductor to conduct the electrical current in the same way. Magnetic current must have a magnetic conductor. So magnetic flux, generally we use iron and iron acts like a conductor for magnetic flux. So we need the iron in there to conduct the magnet. Um, this is uh, 
NEC again, and it shows you the tables where you can find uh, current ratings for different motors. I think most of you are aware of that. Now let's look at magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is proportional to volts divided by frequency or what we call volts per hertz. Well, I think it's obvious that the higher the voltage, the stronger the magnet would be. What is maybe not so obvious is that the higher the frequency, the weaker the magnet gets. So if we want to have a magnet that is always the same strength, which of course is our goal, we want to have the volts per hertz always be the same. And therefore, as the frequency changes, the voltage must change. Um, if the magnetic flux is too high, it's going to saturate the motor. It's going to cause the drive probably to trip, but it will ruin the motor by overheating if we don't fix that. If the magnetic flux is too low, then the motor's happy, but it doesn't have as much torque, and we may not be able to run the load, and the motor may stall. So let's take a look here. This is kind of a very typical motor that I put in here. It's 60 hertz, 460 volt, and a four pole, 30 foot pounds of torque, 12 amps, 1800 RPM, and 10 horsepower. Now, what is the volts per hertz? Well, the volts per hertz is simply the voltage, which is 460, divided by the frequency, which is 60, and that is approximately 7.6. Now let's take that same motor to Europe. What is the frequency in Europe? Well, almost everyone knows that the frequency in Europe is 50 hertz. Why? Why is it 50 hertz? Well, it turns out that, ta that uh, Nikola Tesla kind of invented the power system in the United States. He has a number of different, he tried a number of different frequencies, decided that 60 hertz would work well. Uh, Thomas Edison, was the first one to create power systems in Europe. And it turns out that uh, in Europe, uh, they were going through the change to the metric system and he didn't think 60 Hertz would, uh, would be happy uh, or would be acceptable to people trying to move to metric. So he went to 50 Hertz and therein lies one of the stupidest decisions in all of history. Can you imagine the billions of dollars that we spend simply trying to convert frequency every single year. We had a job not long ago where a compressor came from Europe. They put it in in South America and the motor was designed for 50 hertz. And so when it went to 60 hertz, it went too fast and it too fast, then the compressor of course wouldn't work. And so we actually sold about half a million dollars in variable frequency drive to do nothing but to change from 60 to 50 hertz. And that's not uncommon. It's really unfortunate that we didn't standardize on one frequency. Unfortunately, that's the way it is, and that's the way it'll stay because we, there's just no way to change it now. Now, what is the voltage in Europe? Well, there are a lot of voltages as there are here, but the voltage that in Europe that is comparable to our 460 volts is 380 volts. So in Europe, a typical motor like we have, 10 horsepower motor that runs on 460 volts, would run on 380 volts. What is the volts per hertz? I'll give you just a moment, and then I will show you that the volts per hertz is 7.6. Well, what a coincidence, huh? Actually, that's no coincidence at all. You see, when they changed the frequency to 50 hertz, they had no choice but to change the voltage to 380 hertz because a motor built in America uh, with a 7.6 volts per hertz will not work if it's not 380 volts. Therefore, the 380 volts was selected in order to maintain that same volts per hertz. So while our frequency is, is different and our voltage is different, the volts per hertz is the same. That means a motor built in America or Europe for a volts per hertz of 7.6 will work on either power system and it will run just fine. What is, uh, well, let's continue and then I will, we'll come back to this in a moment. Now, if that's the same motor and this is the very same motor that we're simply taking from the United States, taking to Europe and hooking it up, it's the same motor. Um, it still is four pole, it still has 30 foot pounds of torque and it will generate 30 foot pounds of torque when the volts per hertz is 
it still has a full load current of 12 amps, but what is the speed? Well, as you recognize, if the frequency is lower, then that magnet's going to go around slower around the stator, therefore the speed will be lower, and so the speed will be 5 sixths, 50 divided by 60, 5 sixths of 1800 RPM, and that will be 1500 RPM. So the motor will run fine, but it runs at 1500 RPM. What is the horsepower? Well, horsepower is basically equal to torque times speed. The torque is the same, but the speed is 5 sixths. Therefore, the horsepower is 5 sixths, or 8.3. What is the difference between these two motors? One in the United States, the other in Europe. The answer is the nameplate. And you can have two entirely identical motors come off a of production line, one shipped to the United States, one shipped to Europe. They simply receive different nameplates but they're the same motor. Now on Venus, you may not realize it, but Venus has a 30 hertz power distribution system. What is the voltage on Venus? Because we're going to have to use the same 7.6 volts per hertz motors. And help you out here, 30 hertz divided by 60 hertz, that's one half. Therefore, the voltage has to be one half or 230 volts. The volts per hertz will be the same. It has to be the same in order to create that same magnet. It still has four poles, 30, tor 30 foot pounds of torque, and 12 amps because the magnet is the same. What is the speed? Well, 30 divided by 60 is half. Therefore, the speed is half. What is the horsepower? Half. Again, this is the same motor, just at a different frequency. Uh, this is a little cartoon. Women are, uh, he's reading a book called Tal Grouting Made Easy, and her book is Women Are From Venus, Men Are Idiots, which is probably true. On Mars, they have a 15 hertz power distribution system. You will notice that 15 is one fourth of 60. I'm trying to keep this simple. Therefore, the voltage would be one fourth or 115 volts to maintain the same volts per hertz. When we get down to the speed, it would be one fourth or 450, and the horsepower would be one fourth or 2.5. Let's do one more. This is on Pluto. Uh, Pluto is far out there, and uh, it has to run at 120 hertz. What is the voltage? Well, trying to keep this simple, 120 divided by 60 is double, so it would be two times 460 would give you 920 volts. The speed would be two times 1800 or 3600, and the uh, horsepower would be two times 10 or 20. Let me ask you, can you take a standard 10 horsepower motor and run it at 20 horsepower without it overheating? I would like to give you a minute to think about that, but we are, we're closing in on our time, so I will just tell you, of course you can, because this is not a 10 horsepower motor. It never was a 10 horsepower motor. How do I know that? Because in Europe, it's an 8.3 horsepower motor. The horsepower of that motor depends upon the speed you run it. What is this motor? It is a motor capable of generating 30 foot pounds at 7.6 volts per hertz. Everything else is on the nameplate is just an indication of how you run it. Now, let me ask you, if you're running on Mars or Pluto, in which of those cases is the motor going to run the hottest? Because in Mars, you're only producing 2.5 horsepower. On Pluto, you're producing 10 horsepower. Um, well, let's look. Uh, I'm going to skip a few slides and then come back. Notice that this fan is right here. That fan is responsible for cooling the motor. The air comes in here, the fan spins, and it pushes air over the top in order to cool the motor. Now you'll notice that here, the amps are the same, therefore the heat generated within the motor is the same as far as the current conductors go. The volts per hertz is the same, therefore the heat generated in the magnet is the same. Therefore, in each of these cases, the heat generated in the motor is approximately the same. So in which of these cases is it going to run cooler? Well, I've heard some people say it's going to run cooler on Pluto because Pluto's way cold. Okay, that's probably true. But 
My point is it's going to run the coolest on Pluto because the fan is running the fastest, therefore it's getting the most heating. On Mars, it's going to run the hottest because it's getting less cooling because the fan is cooling it less. So that's why we are very concerned about motors run at slow speed because they lose their cooling. Now, which of these items is on a motor nameplate? Is volts on a motor nameplate? Is hertz? Is speed? Is horsepower? Yes, all those are on the motor nameplate and they're all lies because that doesn't really have anything to do with that particular motor. Those are only applicable if you're running at that particular voltage and that particular speed. Um, what is on the what is that motor? It's a motor generating capable of generating 30 foot pounds of torque at a volts per hertz of 7.6. And of course, it has four poles on it. That's what the motor really is, but you won't find that on the nameplate. So it's very interesting that most of the things on the nameplate are lies. Um, of course, they're, um, I'm exaggerating there, but they uh, most of the things on the motor nameplate change with speed. Uh, the things that don't change don't occur on the nameplate. But this is not so difficult as it might seem. What I want you to remember is that if you keep the right volts per hertz and the variable frequency drive will do that for you, then you always get the same torque. So a motor is a torque producer and it's going to produce that same torque at any speed. And the current in the motor is basically proportional to the torque coming out of that motor. In other words, it's determined by the load. And uh, therefore, um, that's fairly simple. Just remember that horsepower changes with speed, but torque does not. And here you will see a motor nameplate. Notice up here on inverter duty, it can run a 10 to 1 speed range on variable torque or a 4 to 1 speed range on constant torque, which is fairly uh, common. And in, typically, if you're going to run on a VFD, you want a motor that's rated at least 1.15 service factor, but you cannot use that service factor when it's on a drive because we use that service factor to compensate for the loss of cooling as the motor slows down. Um, as you can see, here is a special no motor nameplate that uh, is from US Motors, and it shows across the line we have a service factor of 1.15. When you put it on a VFD, it has a service factor of 1.0. Most motor nameplates don't have an inverter duty section. I think it would be nice if they did, but some manufacturers are beginning to do that. Uh, this is a permanent magnet motor. Don't have time to get into this too much, but you will have slides. This motor will run at synchronous speed. Uh, these are some of the, uh, do, the two different types of permanent magnet motors. Uh, one has the magnets on the uh, inside of the core here, and the other one has the magnets basically strapped on the outside of the core, and that's the difference between an internal permanent magnet and a, uh, do I have that here? I'm sorry. Um, uh, I don't have the other one, but, uh, and a, a magnet, and having the magnet on the outside. So, uh, you can run permanent magnet motors on VFDs, but you must make sure that the VFD is designed to run a permanent magnet motor. These are the advantages and disadvantages of permanent magnet motors. I'm not going to get into that too much, but it is on the slide. And if you have permanent magnet motors, then you can see some of the advantages of using a permanent magnet motor as opposed to an induction motor. Motor nameplates, this is the uh, NEC and it tells you what must be on the motor nameplate. Most motor nameplates have more than the NEC requires. This is table 430.52 that shows the uh, branch circuit, short circuit and ground fault protective devices that can be used on various motors. And this shows breakers and fuses uh, and, and recommends the, uh, the largest size that you may use. This is locked rotor versus inrush. And I won't uh, go over that because we did in the last uh, seminar, but all motors will have a code letter that will tell you what the locked rotor current is compared to the full load amps. <coughs> Inrush occurs only in the first cycle. It's about 10 to 13 times, maybe 10 to 15 times locked rotor, but it's gone within a cycle that just energizes the iron. And then it goes to locked rotor, which is about six times in general full load amps and the locked rotor will decrease as the speed increases. Why do you get the locked rotor? Because when the rotor is still 
and the stator is at 1800 RPM, there's a huge slip and that slip causes very, very high currents. As that rotor comes up to speed, then the slip decreases until it gets within the operating range of the motor. This is kind of a uh, diagram of a motor. And here's another diagram that shows various parts of the motor. We talked about a lot of those later. Now, motor conductors. For the NEC, how big do the conductors need to be? I would simply say that uh, conductors going from the drive to the motor uh, need to be sized at 125% for low voltage, but can be sized at 100% for medium voltage. Um, the conductors coming to the drive, so from the utility to the drive, need to be sized at 125%, uh, both for uh, medium voltage and for low voltage. I think that's something that uh, wasn't thought through very well in the NEC, but that's the way it is. Um, conductors serving several motors, you must have overload protection on each of the motors, and you can put multiple motors on a VFD. Uh, this talks about what the overloads must be, um, and in general, you can have an overload up to 125% uh, if you have a service factor motor, but we do not recommend that on a variable frequency drive. We recommend that you set in there the full load current of the drive and the VFD will trip if it goes over that full load current. Uh, and of course, the higher it goes over, the quicker it will trip. This has to do with motor protection. Uh, I'll leave you to read that, but this is in NEC 430-1.26 and talks a little bit about uh, motor protection on VFDs. Um, same thing there. These are the different motor types. We discussed those in detail in our last course. The motor you really want to use on a VFD is this TEFC motor, so it stays clean and the air goes over the outside. Um, you also want to make sure that it has these features. So you want to make sure that it has service factor, that it's premium efficiency, that it has skewed rotor bars, oversized bearings, and bearing protection. Now we will talk more about bearing protection in the next class, but we also did talk about it in our previous class. And you want to make sure that it has verter, inverter duty insulation. In our next class, we will go over inverter duty insulation in much more detail, but you want to make sure that this has the high spike wire or is NEMA MG1 part 31. This is your motor temperature rise. So you have, most motors are class F rise, but we encourage you when you're on a VFD to get a motor with a class F rise, meaning that it can operate at 150 degrees, 55 degrees centigrade, but you get a motor that only runs at a class B rise. So we call that class F insulation, class B rise. Class H, we have a question on that, and I'm going to uh, address that during the question portion of our class. Um, here is a motor that you can see the, uh, they're rewinding this motor. You can see the stator there, the coils for the stator, the phase insulation paper, and so forth. This is someone putting coils into a motor. Took this out in our shop. We have uh, four motor service shops. Uh, this is when the coils are almost all in place. This is where the coils are all in place, and now you have to begin to hook up the connections. Hopefully, you have somebody who knows how to do that correctly. This is after the motor is insulated, or the stator, actually, and we do all that with the stator, and then we will put the rotor in after that. This is a VPI tank. The VPI tank, you put it in the VPI tank, and you draw a vacuum and that gets all the air out of the rotor, and uh, then you put the insulation in and you get a good solid insulation system without air pockets. Now this is an interesting one. This is our AC synchronous rotor, and on a synchronous rotor, you can see the poles. So if we count them, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Looks like about 12 poles halfway, so this would be a 24 pole motor. But remember that uh, in a, in a uh, AC motor, if it's three phase, you're going to have basically uh, two poles for each of the phases that's on the stator. Um, so this would be a, basically a very, very slow speed motor 
but it, this would uh, still be a 24 pole motor. Uh, here's a 12 pole synchronous motor in construction. Um, there's the poles mounted on it. That's actually a different motor, but, and this is an induction motor. I like this, uh, this picture because you can see on bigger motors, these are all done by hand. And so there's our iron. And then we take the copper bars and we put them through slots in the iron and then they are brazed to a copper end ring. So that's probably the best slide that I have come across for showing you motor construction. And that's how the large motors are created. The smaller ones, they just stamp out the iron and they actually pour liquid aluminum in there and let it harden. Um, there's a large synchronous motor and you can see some of those, these just various pictures. There's a 91,000 kilowatt, 54 pole motor. So you can see that these motors do occur at very large sizes. And it is 1045, that's the end of our presentation. So I'm going to turn the, uh, the class up back to Tyler and we'll see if we have any questions. Absolutely, well, let's start with the first question. Um, back to the class H insulation that you mentioned, someone that said that they have a customer they've been working with that is adamant a motor is better specified with class H insulation because it will increase the motor life. In this situation, they are not loading the motor to 100% and the ambient temperature is typically much lower than the motor's rated ambient temperature. Is the initial additional cost up front uh, actually worth the payback in this situation? So I have kind of strong feelings about this, and this this uh, class uh, this question came in earlier, which is why I uh, skipped over that uh, B F and H insulation a little bit, so we could talk about it some more right now. Um, B insulation used to be the standard. F insulation is now the standard, and if you buy just a standard motor, you get F insulation. You do not have to pay extra for it. So I always like things that you don't have to pay extra for. If you attended our last classes on motors, what is the number one reason for motor failure? The answer is motor bearings. What is the, one, the number one reason for motor bearing failure? The answer is improper or lack of lubrication. So very, very seldom do motor windings occur. I, I shouldn't say that, it's not that seldom, but I'm saying that the most frequent cause is in the bearings. Now, if you have class H insulation, you are going to be able to run that motor really, really hot. And in theory, for every 10 degrees difference in terms of running the motor, you get a doubling or a halving of the life. So in other words, if your motor insulation can run 10 degrees hotter than where you're actually running it, you will increase the motor insulation or the motor life by double. However, if you're actually running your motor at temperatures uh, that class H insulation is going, it can withstand, you're probably going to destroy your bearings. Class H insulation has nothing to do with the bearings. And if you have a situation in which you've got special bearings and special grease, and you're running a motor, let's say in a furnace, that may be a situation where you wanna pay that extra for class S H insulation. But if it's a standard motor, I really think class H insulation is an absolute waste of money. I would highly recommend that you stick with the class F insulation. Use your money to do this. Get a service factor motor, get a motor that runs cool, get a motor with oversized bearings, get a good TEFC cast iron motor that runs cool. Your motor will last far longer if you do those things than it will with class H insulation. Um, very seldom, uh, unless you're drastically overheating that motor, very seldom are you going to find that a motor failure is caused by a breakdown of insula insulation due to high heat. So my opinion I, I is definitely not worth the money. Great. We actually had two questions come in asking for more clarification about how you could run one motor, more than one motor on a single drive. All right, thank you very much. Now you know that if you, you run one motor on a drive and then you close a contactor on a second motor on that same drive. So the first motor is running at 60 hertz, the second motor is just starting, that second motor is going to take six times current. 
and that's likely to trip the drive. Now, drives have become very sophisticated, and they have ways these days of, uh, of actually going into current limit and allowing that motor to come up to speed and not tripping. And in fan walls, um, we actually sometimes do that intentionally. But for the most part, you never want to close a contactor onto a drive that's already running because you're probably going to trip the drive. So if you have one motor running, then you want to start the second motor. What you really should do is bring the first motor down to zero speed, then close the contactor to the second motor, and then bring both motors up together. We will talk about this when we get to the VFD section, but I want you to remember this. Motors on VFDs do not start. They only run. We generally say when you start a motor, you get six times current. That's because the slip is 100%. And so we have this starting portion in which you get very low power factor. The torque can be sometimes less, um, high currents, and that's the starting portion. And then when you get up above the, uh, the full load amps or the full load speed of the motor, then you're in the running portion of that motor. When you're on a VFD, you never start a motor. You always run the motor because you maintain that slip within the rated slip of the motor and you gradually bring it up and the motor's always running. It never starts. So try to uh, start both motors together. Both motors will run at the same speed. Make sure that the drive amperage is equal to the total of the full load amps of the two motors and then you're going to have to have separate contactors on each of those motors, and you're going to have to have separate overload relays. Primarily, uh, overload relay, the, the overload relay function is handled in the drive if you have one drive and one motor. But if you have one drive and multiple motors, we'll just say two motors, then the drive has no way of knowing that one of those motors might be underloaded and the other one overloaded because all it's seeing is the total current and therefore the NEC requires that you have overload relays on each of those two motors. So I hope, hope that answers the question. You can run as many motors as you want on a variable frequency drive uh, on the output. Now, when you get to a lot of motors and a lot of cable, it may be necessary for you to put in uh, load reactors or we'd prefer a DVD-T filter because of all the cabling and the capacitance in the cabling. Uh, that can be an issue. Let's say you have one drive on conveyors and there's motors all over the place and they're all in the one drive, but there's lots and lots of wire. You may need a DVD-T filter to prevent the motor from tripping due to the capacitance in the wire and in those cables, but that's uh, seldom necessary. And so you can, you can run multiple motors on a drive. You, can, uh, you have to run them both at the same speed, obviously. What are the main differences between an integrated VFD and a normal one? Yeah, so this is pretty pretty simple question. Um, there's a certain profit in variable frequency drives, and so when variable frequency drives came on the market, everybody would buy a variable frequency drive in its own box, they'd mount it there, and then they would run the motor. Well, eventually, the people that made the fans, that made the pumps, that made other equipment said, wow, if we supplied the VFD, we could get that profit rather than letting some electrical VFD manufacturer get that profit. And so an integrated VFD is simply something that mounts inside of the load equipment. So a fan or a pump or a compressor or anything like that, if the uh, compressor manufacturer provides the compressor and he chooses to mount the VFD in his compressor control cabinet, then that would generally be called an integrated VFD. We're going to see a lot more integrated VFDs as VFDs become co more common. Um, obviously, a car manufacturer or people who provide electric buses are going to integrate the VFD within that whole control package. But basically, yes, yeah, just a matter of who provides it and where they physically mount the VFD. Uh, he said that they were one of the questions, to paraphrase it, what they're asking is basically, as you slow the motor, at what point do you need to start looking at external cooling? Yes, very good question. So it, the answer is it depends on the motor. And if we go with what I always recommend, 
a very good quality, totally enclosed, fan-cooled, cast iron motor with a minimum of 1.15 service factor, then most of those motors can operate over a 10 to 1 speed range with a variable torque load. Now, variable torque load typically we think of as a fan or a pump, and that means as the fan slows down, it doesn't require as much torque to run it. So if you're down at 6 hertz, which would be a tenth of 60 hertz, and you're running that fan, you're not getting a lot of cooling on the motor. But on the other hand, it's taking almost zero torque to run that fan at that point, and therefore you're not getting as much heat in the motor because the current's so low. Um, on the other hand, what if you have a constant torque motor? The constant torque motors typically are rated for a four to one speed range, so they can run at 25% of their rated speed at full torque. And again, they're going to run hotter at that point, but it is the service factor that uh, allows the, uh, if you buy a service factor motor, then it's gonna be a cooler running motor and you use the service factor to compensate for the reduced cooling. Uh, so on those, anytime you go below 25% speed, then you're going to need external cooling. Again, I have to put in the caveat that says that uh, this depends on the motor. So if you're gonna run at quite low speeds, you do wanna check uh, with the, on the motor nameplate or the motor cut sheet and find out what that motor manufacturer says. There are some sometimes pretty good motors that I've seen that only allow you to run over a two to one speed range with constant torque. So it is something you wanna check. All right, you mentioned recommending oversized bearings. How do you arrive at what you would consider the optimal bearing size? Yeah, so typically um, this depends on the motor manufacturer. You can't put you know, 12 foot bearings in a one horsepower motor, I mean, it's crazy. Um, most motor manufacturers will offer oversized bearings and that's just generally one size larger than the standard bearing. And in many cases on these motors, it's, you don't even get that choice. They will just tell you that a feature of that motor is oversized bearings. And I would say that is really the most common uh, way that this is done. You can't go and say, I would like this size bearing in this motor. It's just that if you buy a really good quality motor from a quality motor manufacturer, one of the features of that motor is that they will have larger bearings in it. And that's really your only choice. But you definitely want to uh, have oversized bearings whenever you're running on a variable frequency drive. And of course, you also want to have bearing protection, which is something that we will be talking about next week. Great. Uh, how do you mitigate cable length limitations on the output of VFDs? So the cable length limitations. Uh, if you have cable length, first of all, you want to use a NEMA MG1 Part 31 insulation. We will talk about that next time, but NEMA specifies motors. NEMA is the motor spec, National Electrical Manufacturers. And they have a uh, part 30 and a part 31. Part 30 is for standard motors. Part 31 is for VFD motors. And the VFD motors have premium insulation. So you always want to get a motor with that premium insulation. The next thing you want to look at is if you have uh, a drive that is very sophisticated and uh, one of the drives that the, our, what I feel is kind of our best drive, the Mitsubishi, has something they call soft PWM. And if you use soft PWM, you can actually go to 1600 feet uh, as long as you have a VFD rated motor and not worry about the cable length. Um, not all drives have that. And so if you wanna be safe, we would recommend 100 feet. Anything less than 100 feet, you want to use, you, you, just, you just hook the motor up to the drive, you're fine. But again, make sure you have that premium insulation and that's a VFD rated motor. If it's over 100 feet, we would recommend putting in what's called a DVDT filter. A DVDT filter basically knocks the peaks off that PWM waveform and keeps the voltages down to a point where they're not going to damage the motor insulation. Next week, we are going to show you pictures of DVDT filters and we'll show you, we'll show you a picture of what the filter looks like. Uh, 
and we show you also a picture of what it does. We'll look at waveforms with and without a DVD-T filter. So that's kind of the rule of thumb, and different manufacturers may say, well, we could go 75 feet or whatever. Um, but I would say anytime it's over 100 feet between the motor and the drive, you want to either use a DVD-T filter or uh, get a drive that is that has special PWM switching patterns that uh, allow you to go out to 1,600 feet. Now, that's for a low-voltage drive. For medium voltage, it's completely different, and I think we covered that in our medium-voltage drive class. Many medium-voltage drives have very, very good output waveforms where you don't need to do that. All right. What could cause an irregular waveform? Oh, now that's a, that's a really, there's, there's uh, some information on this in our motor class, but irregular waveforms could be caused by a number of things. It could be caused by a defective drive. Now, in most cases, I would tell you that the drive's probably going to trip before it gives you an irregular output waveform because you have sensors in there and if, if you, let's say you lose a transistor on the output and you're getting an irregular waveform, then uh, you are probably gonna trip the drive. An irregular waveform could be caused by a defective or a uh, failed motor. Um, you can have, for instance, if you have open rotor bars, you can get uh, a changes in the current waveform. If you have shorted windings, you can get uh, differences in the current waveform. Um, but for the most part, um, those waveforms are very accurate because they're all controlled by microprocessor and seldom will you see a waveform coming out of the drive itself that isn't pretty darn good. What about sign filters for long motor cable? When would you use a DVD-T filter versus sign filter and which is best? Yeah, so a DVD-T filter is similar to a sine wave filter. Um, but if you look at, you've got, if you look at the drive, you've got a PWM waveform going into the filter, and that PWM waveform can have peaks that reach like 1500 volts sometimes. And uh, so when you go through a DVD-T filter, you still see the PWM waveform on the output of the filter, but the, the peaks of those voltage waveforms will be less than 1000 volts, and a standard motor has 1000 volt insulation. So I probably should have mentioned that if you have a standard motor, not a VFD motor, but a standard motor, you can still run it on a VFD, but in that case, you really probably want to use a DVD-T filter to keep those spikes below 1,000 volts. Now, a sine wave filter, when you look at the output of a sine wave filter, you don't see the PDMM waveform at all. You see a sine wave. And we generally don't use sine wave filters for one reason, they're pricey. Um, our cost as a VFD manufacturer, uh, our cost on a sine wave filter is about the same as our cost on a VFD. And so I'm not talking about the, the enclosure and everything, I'm just saying the VFD chassis. We pay about the same for the VFD chassis as we did do for a good sine wave filter. So they're expensive. And we generally don't recommend them unless you have a downhole motor. If you have a submersible motor that's downhole number one they tend to not have as good insulation because of the way they have to be built very very skinny with long windings you've got cables going down there that can exacerbate those voltage waveforms and the cost to pull a submersible motor and replace it is just really high and so our recommendation is anytime you have a submersible motor you should always use a sine wave filter so that you have a good sine wave going to that motor. That's generally the only time we use it, although in cases where the motor is extremely sensitive or you've had failures, uh, certainly a sine wave, failure, uh, sine wave filter is an option, but we generally only use it on submersible motors, and we recommend that you always use it on all submersible motors. All right, we still have questions coming in, but due to time, we will only have... Uh, time to answer one more. Uh, it is, does the integrated VFD have an advantage of a short cable run? Um, I think that it is true that the integrated VFD has the advantage of a short cable run. However, um, on if, if you have a VFD 
running a motor, seldom is it more than 100 feet between the motor and the drive, and therefore I would not really say that that's a real advantage. But it could be an advantage if you don't really have any other place to put a VFD. Now, one of the big disadvantages of that is we'll get into harmonics. Uh, when you get an integrated VFD, they just generally put it in there for you and you have no control over it. And so typically they do not put in any harmonic mitigation. And so we will we'll talk about that in depth in about three weeks. Um, but IEEE 519 is the harmonic standard. We need to control our harmonics and typically the guys who integrate that into their equipment are mechanical guys and they just say that's an electrical problem it, it's not our problem we're not worrying about it and so you can end up with some serious harmonic problems when you use an integrated vfd great thank you so much everyone for joining us for today's webinar